Here we go. Great, so welcome everybody to our regular Wednesday gathering. Last two weeks, I was in a far, far away in Hawaii here while it was single digits in St. Louis. We had a chance to give a retreat with the Carmelite sisters um, in Hawaii. So it was a magical time. I also had a wonderful time with um, some new friends that I've met. I was able to do a funeral for a, for the, for a friend. I, apparently I had done the funeral for his mother earlier in the year. So when my friend Leo became critically ill and was in hospice, his wife called me and asked me if I would do the, celebrate the funeral for him um, when he passed out of hospice. So I agreed, I was very happy and honored to do that. A um, couple of miracle stories around Leo's kind of final days on this earth, but I won't use any time on the gathering today to describe those to you, but it was a, it was a wonderful time. It bonded me very strongly to their family. And, and then as uh, Leo's wife, Terry and I were doing the funeral planning, um, I, I said to her, you know, we were talking about the songs for the mass and uh, and who would be there and was there eulogy and details like that that you always go through for funeral planning. And, and then um, I said, well, we go straight to the cemetery from the church. And she said, and then she got this kind of bashful look on her face. Mm -hmm. And she, well, first she said, no, she said, he's being cremated. And I said, oh, that's okay. I said, um, because the Catholic Church endorses cremation so long as, I'll give you a little Catholic teaching here, a little formal Catholic background. It's fine to use cremation as a way, a means of returning from dust to dust. It just happens a little quicker with cremation, <laughs> but everything, same thing happens in the coffin, except you save a big expense. I said, but uh, I said, so later, I said, maybe later you'll have the ashes interned and I can come and bless the grave and we can do the regular gravesite ceremony. That's when she got the bashful look on her face and she said, pregnant pause. And she said, well, father, Actually, Leo wanted his ashes taken back to Kauai, Hawaii, and scattered in the Pacific Ocean, where we spent so many beautiful times together. So I manufactured my most severe clerical stare, and I said, well, Terry, in that case, I have two things to say to you. See, I'd be, I could mimic a Monsignor if I needed to. Terry... I've got two things to say to you. It is absolutely forbidden by the Catholic Church in every way conceivable that you would desecrate the immortal remains of any immortal soul by casting them into the Pacific Ocean in Hawaii. But should you choose to do so, I think it's very important that I be there <laughs> to oversee this sacrilegious operation so we can bring a little additional sacredness to it. <laughs> Actually, it was, a, it was the, one of the most beautiful, I, I, the weather was perfect. It was where Leo and Terry felt closest to God. Their closest friends were there. If there ever was a holy communion without holy without the sacrament of Holy Communion. And maybe one of the great upshots of that encounter was that uh, two of Kathy, two of Terry's friends and Leo's friends, there were 10 of the, us there, I believe, celebrating this, um, which was very, very nice. And, uh, but two of those friends in particular, I've now become even closer friends with. And one of those friends and I started talking about <clears throat> a deeper approach to the Catholic faith. And she happens to have an interest in uh, Carmelite spirituality and, and in particular, the spirituality of St. John of the Cross. And so, of course, I have been a Carmelite my whole spiritual life, really in spirit, that is to say. I studied started studying John of the Cross very intently back in 1971 when my when my real model for spirituality, the religious life and union with God, Sister Peter Claver, whose picture is hanging here in the dining room, when Sister Peter Claver introduced me to, actually was a layman, 
at the house of prayer in Pennsylvania, where Sister Peter was having this house of prayer, uh, a fellow named John Thornton came up and we were in a discussion together. And he said, if you really want to know what union with God means, you should really read John of the Cross. And Sister Peter seconded that suggestion. So that led me on a on a long journey into the vision of John of the Cross. And, um, and that was long before I had encountered St. Athanasius's prayer, God became man so man could become God, which is the linchpin of these Wednesday gatherings. I, for those of you who may be relatively new to the gatherings, my spiritual life as a Catholic, even as a Catholic priest, um, really moved into hyperdrive when I encountered that phrase for the first time, which you can find in the Catechism of the Catholic Church under the section, why did God became man? And the, and the answer that I always thought was God became man in order to atone for our sins. But the real truth of the matter is God became man so that we could become God. In other words, as the early church fathers said, the humanization of God in Christ is the divinization of the human race. The humanization of God is the divinization of humanity. And so there's an exchange, a mysterious exchange that takes place there in the incarnation. And I have since learned by studying other mystics and other church fathers that not only did the, in time, this, this exchange or this union or this nuptial interpenetration of God with humanity and the elevation of humanity to the status of godness in a finite form. We are God, as the early church fathers said repeatedly, we are gods, small g, gods in God. And I just was reading, incidentally, I'll come back to this. You hear me speak of this often on the Wednesday gatherings. This is just a little aside here because the main thrust here is the, diviniz the humanization of God in, in the person of Jesus is the deification or the divinization of all of humanity. But we also must understand that though Jesus became, God became incarnate at a certain point in what we call sequential time, the eternal word whom Jesus is existed from all eternity. So Jesus, even in his humanity, existed from all eternity, which means that that humanity did not become divine in, in its own way, in God, and through God, and by God, and for God. Humanity did not become divine the moment Jesus was conceived in his mother's womb. That's when it became revealed that humanity was divine. But the divinity of humanity was conceived in God prior to the foundation of the world. So we are, as I said to the people and say, try to say every Sunday, you come from glory and you return to glory. And there's no two ways about it, okay? In the meantime, things get messy, <laughs> okay? But, but the infinite love of God has a way of even turning evil into its opposite. Goodness has a way of turning evil into its opposite, just as in recovery from alcoholism or any other serious illness or any illness itself. When the pain of holding on becomes greater than the pain of letting go, you let go. And the moment you let go, you have turned your, you have turned al alchemically, you have turned the lead of your suffering into the gold of God's glory because God is to be found in every moment of letting go-ness, what the Germans call, what Meister Eckhart called Gelassenheit, letting go-ness acceptance, let it be to me according to your word, the disposition of Mary. That's why Jesus says in today's gospel, by the way, another little parenthesis here on the way down this path of God became man so man could become God. This is the overarching vision of the Wednesday gathering. God became man so man could become God. What's the meaning of that and how does it shape our Christian existence? And how does it add hope to what we do? And how does it and, and, and how does it how does it infuse what we do and who we are with a joy that is not found otherwise outside this kind of vision of God and Christ? Okay. But another little aside today, Jesus tells his apostles. He tells first he tells the parable about the sower, and even before that, 
these are two very important lines in today's gospel that are often overlooked, and I could talk for three days just on these two lines. And the two lines seem absolutely inconsequential to the meaning of the gospel, but there is no line in the scripture that is inconsequential to the gospel. The whole of the gospel can be perceived in every line, not every line, but even every word, and not even every word, every letter of every word, if you know how to see it. Just like a shattered mirror, even in the smallest shard, contains the whole of the person who's looking at it. Okay, so scripture, that's how the early church fathers looked at the scripture. The whole was contained in the fragment, and all the fragments constitute the whole, and no one fragment can be understood apart from the whole. So the whole and the part always belong together. And in this world, we always have just a visible... Uh, we have a visible, we, we, uh, only the part is always only visible to us, but we have an intuitive sense of the whole to which the part belongs. This is another topic, philosophical and theological, that I'm not going to go any further with this morning. So all of the scripture is contained in every word, and every, uh, every word can only be understood in the context of the whole of the scripture. So you have to read them back and forth. There's kind of a toggling hermeneutic here, a toggling principle of interpretation. You must always move from the part to the whole, from the whole to the part. And this is a dynamic process that actually mirrors the Trinity, Father and the Son being parts of the whole, mediated by the Holy Spirit, who toggles back before, in between them, seeing their distinctness and their unity all at the same time. So everything, mm -hmm. everything that is in God is always both distinct and unified at the same time. It's both parts and whole, the, the one and the many. The many are the three persons of the Trinity. The one is God. The parts are all the words of Scripture. Those are the many, all the different words. But when they're assembled, they become the one called the Scripture. Anyway, I could you can see I could talk about this forever. Okay, but let's leave that there. Let me just give you the first two lines of today's gospel, and I'm not going to repeat them exactly because I can't remember them, but it says, Jesus was teaching along the shore of the sea. Okay, that seems that seems just like an uninteresting, prosaic, anodyne introductory line of a geographical detail. It's actually a tremendous Trinitarian truth, if you know how to read it. He was with his father. He was with his father. Whenever he said, whenever it says he was walking along the sea or he went up the mountain, both the sea and the mountain were, were natural images for the incarnate word of the infinite ocean and infinite height of his father's benevolence. Wow. Okay. So everything in, everything in nature also spoke to Jesus of his father. So he always teaches, often teaches by the sea or on the mountain. Because it's there that he is channeling, as it were. Nothing I have, he says. All that I have comes to me from my father. And all that I have from him, I bequeath to you. I was with the sisters in Hawaii. I probably should put the video up on screen share if I knew how to do it without losing my, my train of thought here. So I won't do it. But in their back garden, they have three cascading fountains. They have a waterfall short waterfall, four or five feet, down into a pool where there are beautiful white goldfish. And then that pool pours into another pool where there are beautiful red goldfish. And that pool pours into a further one where there's fish of all sorts. How beautiful. And it's surrounded by palm trees and vegetation and flowers that have an aroma. And before the conferences with the sisters, I would go out and sit in the chair and watch those three cascading waterfalls. And I said to the sisters, I said, you know, to behold the Trinity, you need to go no, no further than outside in your backyard. I said, because there is an unseen source of your waterfalls in the back. And those are the mountains of Hawaii. And those mountains, the water comes down from those mountains, downhill, into the property of the sisters, flows into that first fountain. So that first fountain, you might say, is the appearance of living water from the unseen source, which is the mountain away. But in our Trinitarian model, the mountain would be the Father, unseen, unknown, un, un, don't even know where it comes from, but that's where the water comes from. 
It appears to us in the form of a cascading fountain, which is the living water, the water coming from the side of Christ on the cross. Those are all images for the incarnate Son of God. The Son of God is the pouring out or the self-divestment or the relinquishment of the Father into the Son. All that the Son has is the Father's life given to him from the Father without the loss of the Father's identity. So the Father himself is a mystery of kenosis. The Father himself is a mystery of self-emptying, though he was in the form of God. And Jesus himself was a mystery of self-emptying. Though he was in the form of God, he did not deem equality with God something to be held on to or possessed, grasp that. Rather, he poured himself out to the point of death on a cross. Meaning, so the father empties himself into the son. The son is, the son's being is the self-emptying of the father. The son is because the father is. And the father's isness somehow precedes the isness of the son. That's why we call the son the begotten one. And we call the Father the begetter. So the Son is begotten of the Father, and the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. So the Spirit is the pouring out, the mutual pouring out of the Father and the Son of their own life upon creation. Or better said, creation is the finite outpouringness of the infinite ineffable, unspeakable, uncreated, and uncontainable mystery of God, life of God. Okay? So, so it's not only that human beings come from God, everything comes from God. And everything has its own identity. Actually, everything has its own soul, that is to say, its own inner form, an identity, the like the rooster, from God. Everything is of God. Everything is through God. Everything is by God. And so, by extension, everything is not exactly identical with God, but there is nothing that is not in God. <laughs> there is nothing that exists apart from God. There is no outside God. You can never go outside God. You can never be you can never be outside God. God can never be outside you. We, in him we live and move and have our being. And now that's what I want to talk about today. The profundity of that line of St. Paul. Yesterday we had the conversion of St. Paul. And the conversion of St. Paul was just that. He moved from an understanding of God and an experience of God and an education about God as something that was outside himself. God was out there, transcendent. And he had given us the law in order to know how to get to him or at least be in right relationship with him. When the veil was lifted from St. Paul on the road to Damascus, and Jesus said, who are you persecuting? Paul said, who are you? And he said, I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. And all Paul could remember was us persecuting Christians. How can I be persecuting him? And then in a flash of light that blinded him for three days, Paul realized intuitively, which then took him over 14 years in the desert to process, because he went to Arabia after that, spent 14 years in the desert like a monk, trying to grasp what God had revealed to him. And what he had revealed to him is what we are, what he then subsequently wrote about, and what the early church fathers amplified upon, and what you're learning in this gathering. All these things came from when Paul's veil was lifted, God is in me and I am in God, and nothing can harm me. Neither death, nor tribulation, nor power, nor principality, none of this can can is stronger than the love of Christ Jesus. For 14 years, did the Holy Spirit help him? Really sure, of course, that? of course, of course. So three centuries later, you get people like St. Athanasius and the church father, Simeon, the new theologian here that I'm going to read. You probably never heard of him. One of the greatest saints ever. Let me, let me read this. this is, so this is an amplification on the realization 
that everything comes from God and therefore everything abides in God. And therefore God's life is in everything. All that sin does is obscure our perception of God's life in us. You know, I sometimes refer to these near-death experiences only because you have people who recount them who had no religion at all before they were, were had this experience. I, I want to say this, Paul, Paul's, Paul's experience of Christ on the road and the apostles' experience of Jesus risen from the dead was like a near-death experience without having a near-death experience. Mm -hmm. It was it, people who have near death experiences go from this side to the other side and then return. Okay. In the case of Christ, we have a man who came from the other side into the side, then returned to the other side. And that's what happened in both the incarnation and the resurrection. They were getting a glimpse of the other side in human form and then momentarily in the form that he assumes on the other side. Okay, and then the veil came down again. So all the things that we account as religion are still, re, are still fumblings towards God in the dark. The whole religious world is still as if it's a singular St. Paul still in blindness groping for the miracle on the way to Damascus. Fortunately for us, we've come to the Wednesday gathering, which is the road to Damascus. <laughs> Just kidding. I'll go to confession no, if I must. Okay. But, <laughs> but, it, but it is true. So. <laughs> okay, I'm going to read you a couple of quotes here today because I know we have a couple of people, a couple in the room as well as on the Zoom who are relatively new to the gatherings. So that's a little bit of an introduction. So I'm coming to us from a Pauline patristic, that is to say early church, and then a Catholic mystical tradition running through not just John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila, but many other Catholic mystics, including Ignatius of Loyola, all the way back to the, but, but the, real, the real fertile ground of the, um, the real fertile ground of the Catholic tradition is found in the early three centuries when it had not become Latinized. It had not become Romanized. It had not become legalized. Okay, and for those of you who have not heard this rough and ready sketch again, you know, Christianity started in Jerusalem and then spread east into Belarus, into Ukraine, the places we're hearing about on the news today, Syria, Assyria, Iran, Iraq, all those were thriving ancient Christian sites of mysticism and devotion and Eucharistic celebration and moral formation. Okay. And then it, but it, but it spread, spread east and west. So the saints we had today, St. Timothy was from Turkey, modern day Turkey, then uh, 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 what do they call it? Asia Minor. The greatest saints in the church all came from Turkey. The, the greatest writers of the church came from Asia Minor, Gregory of Nyssa, Gregory of Nazianzen, Basil the Great. These people came from Turkey. Ephraim the Syrian, he came from Syria, where, you know, Saddam Hussein, not Hussein, but the other wacko over there. You know, uh, uh, that's the try. I pray for the Eastern Catholics all the time because uh, their churches, the most ancient churches in Christianity have been, have been destroyed. Christian where all the Christian earliest Christian art as well. So when, it, but as the, as, and, and in that, in that environment, primarily following St. Paul, St. Paul was the one who promoted this image of Jesus as larger than just the son of Mary. He was the eternal word. John on the island of Patmos, uh, the upper, the island of Cyprus was where Titus was. These are, you know, they don't even speak English. They didn't speak Latin. They spoke, you know, they spoke Greek and they spoke Syriac and they spoke Aramaic. So, and in those languages, the, the, the relationship with God is that of family, that of, that of blood, that of bondedness. But as it moved further to the West, it encountered the legal categories and, and rigid discipline of, of Rome. And so, so the church in Rome and the church in Ephesus thought of Christ, thought of God, thought of the Trinity, thought of Mary, thought of the Eucharist. They thought of it in much different terms. And so when they finally met at some of these early councils like Chalcedon and Nicaea, 
they had a hard time understanding each other. You know, the Greeks have 11, 12 words for love. It's like an Eskimo trying to talk to a guy from Florida about snow. You know, it's, it's that doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, they both have a similar concept of weather, but what weather means in Alaska is different from what weather means. And it was, well, or, or men and women, you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Well, the Eastern church is like a woman. It's, oh boy, I'm on shaky ground right now. So I won't, I won't, I won't make any generalizations, but let me say in the main, taking it out of the male female comparison for a minute, the East is filled with the East liturgy. Today, if you go to an Eastern Catholic liturgy, there's nothing that is spoken. It's all sung, including the gospel. The only thing that's spoken is the homily. And given some of the homilies you hear, you, you'd prefer that they were sung or just remain silent. But all that being said, so it's a, it's a melodious, mellifluous, poetic, mystical, romantic, uh, idealistic, uh, inspirational experience of God. The, re, the, the Eucharist for an Eastern Catholic is a mystical encounter with a living person. In the West, it's a duty that we do. We have an obligation to do it. Do it, damn it. Just like Romans, the highest virtue was doing your duty. So the Mass became a duty and religion became a duty, and it became an obligation, and there's lots of reasons why this, so, so as many of the popes have said, including John Paul and Benedict and many of their predecessors, over the last 800, 900 years, the, the, the mystery of Christianity has become scleroticized, to use a word of Pope Benedict the 16th. Our arteries, our, our spiritual arteries have become, we have sclerosis of the arteries, uh, John Paul II compared it to, to, to breathing with two lungs, the Eastern lung and the Western lung. And then he turned to one of his close advisors and he said, yeah, and the Western lung has asthma and has been in a closed coal mine for 800 years. <laughs> We're kind of gasping for, for religious air. And I, and I believe that to be absolutely true. And I could go off now on a tangent about the future of the church and what it's going to look like and why I'm glad that those who are in the church for the wrong reasons won't be coming back when all the churches close because they'll be too too angry at the archbishop that is a good thing I'll stop I'll stop there and stop my little harangue there but let me read you this so we have from Athanasius and I could quote you a hundred church fathers who say something similar God became man so that man could become God in other words God comes to us so that we can come to him Come to me, says Jesus, and I will give you rest. It's always a coming to. It's, it, it's God is always knocking on the human heart. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. To everyone who enters to me, I will enter and make my home with them. And my father and I will take dining with them. That's the, that's the invitation of the gospel. So once you get this vision of God coming to humanity to heal it, to rescue it, to, to, to impart to humanity a share in the divine Trinitarian bliss, you will have a better narrative. You will then begin to see that everywhere in Scripture. Scripture does not speak to us on its own. You cannot pick up the words and get something out of it. You have to know what is the storyline here. Giving you a few facts, quoting a few lines never tells you anything. I told told the story last week in church. I'll tell it again here. These are all fundamental principles that we discuss often on the Wednesday gatherings that I'm just going over briefly here for the, for the uh, benefit of the newcomers. I used an example last, last, last week. I, there's another one I want to think of that I just heard yesterday. Um, anyway, I'll use the one from last week. There was, you know, there was a plane that was being delayed on the tarmac um, it was jam-packed, full, full flight. There were there was two parents and a seven-year-old boy in the back. And the little boy was going absolutely ballistic. And they sat there for two hours and his kid never stopped screaming the whole time. Everybody was screaming at the whole plane by the time. So just when they're getting ready to take off, the parents decide they're going to get, everybody's saying, get your kid off this plane. Call for the, call for the jetway, get this kid off. So finally they cave into the pressure and they take the kid off the plane, and boy, everybody's glad to be back in that, and 
there was a doctor who was telling the story on this on this event. She was she was she was this is a medical doctor. Her name is Dr. Mary Neal, N E A L. If you've ever not watched her near death experience on YouTube, you should do it. Mary Neal, N E A L. And she was telling her near death experience, but she was and in the context of telling her near death experience, she was saying what you realize when you go to the other side is that that you understand everything completely when your soul leaves your body. You understand why you did what you did. You understand why others did what they did and why they did it to you. And in that understanding, there is an there is immediate and perfect forgiveness. And she said, but you don't, in this world, we still have a, like she said, it's like we have a cone over top of us that of darkness that keeps the light in us from being seen by ourselves and by others. And she said, when you die, that cone of darkness is lifted and you understand. And she said to understand completely is to forgive completely. And she used this example of this couple because she unwittingly, before her near-death experience, followed this couple off the plane. And, and as soon as they got into the lobby, the kid was just fine. And so the doctor was sitting there. She was waiting for, a, get a, I guess, get a later flight. And so she just said to the parents, you know, boy, what a change in your son. I mean, he was, what was wrong? I'm a doctor. Is there anything I could do for, for him? And the parents said, no. They, they said, we've just, we've just gotten this child from Romania. And he's been uh, in three foster homes in three different countries. And each time he suffered sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. So when he gets on an airplane, he thinks he's getting ready for another experience. And she said, as soon as I heard that, she said, if everybody on the plane, I mean, it would have maybe perhaps still been irritating. But if you understand, now the Bible, Bill, our Bible thumper here is not here. He just went to the bathroom. But if you understand that, then you 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 can read the words one way. But if you have a larger understanding that God's overall purpose here is to divinize humanity, rather than to have humanity make up for some kind of primordial offense they committed, you're going to read the Bible in an entirely different key. So everything depends upon the pre-established narrative that you come to the Bible with rather than the facts of the matter. And you can see this in our political debate as well. People who have different narratives interpret the same events in completely different ways, okay? So the, the Bible wars and the political wars are founded on the same principle. People come to the facts with different frameworks of interpretation. What I'm trying to deliver on the Wednesday gatherings is a framework of interpretation that I understand to be, and not just me, Pope Benedict, Pope John Paul II, others who are trying to bring this framework of understanding of God's love into a tradition in the West anyway, in Catholicism, that had grown what well, was on hospice, basically, spiritually speaking. OK, so they are trying to bring the Western tradition back to that's why the, 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 the movement that preceded Vatican II was called Resource Mont. It came came out of France primarily, but also Germany. It, and, and that word in French, Resource Mont, means return to the sources, going back to the very beginnings. What was the vision that enabled the church to be a church of martyrs? What did they have that we don't have? Where did they get their joy in suffering that we don't have? Let's return to the sources. Let's find out what was the vision of those men and women who gladly suffered torture of the worst kind in order to let people know something. So I wrote down something today. I guess I'm a little bit jumping all over the place here, but this is getting to where I want to go eventually. So bear with me here. I wrote down this. We had this responsorial psalm yesterday, okay? I'm just going to quote yesterday or a couple of days ago. Said this, okay? And, and this is, I, when I thought of this, I thought this is a great way to explain, especially to the newcomers on the gathering, what I'm all about, what we're all about here. Um, because what we're all about here is taking the normal religious language that we hear and goes in one ear and out the other ear, 
I'm, or the religious cliches that everybody repeats without having a darn clue about what they could possibly mean and doesn't think a second about what they could possibly mean. Just repeat them like parrots on a, on a, on a telephone line. Yes, sir. So here's, here's, a, here's, here's a responsorial song that we all dutifully said, but I want to tell you the questions that came up in my heart and mind as I heard, that, heard it. Go out to all the world and tell the good news. And then everybody, you know, the lector thinking Vatican II, more participation means holding up your hands and getting more people to talk, says, and everybody says, go out to all the world and tell the good news. And then I think I'm sitting in my chair and I'm thinking to myself, what's the good news? I was with a priest gathering last Friday. I said, uh, if you had to tell somebody in one sentence, what's the good news, what would you tell them? I tell them the gospel. And what would that mean? Nothing. <laughs> yeah, that's the good news. That's the, that's the word, that's the Greek word for the good news. What's the good news? Be good or you won't go to heaven? Is that the good news? Better watch out, you better not shout, you better not cry, you better not pout, I'm telling you why. So I said, is there one priest in a thousand? Is there one Catholic in 10,000 who could tell you in a single sentence what's the good news? Is there one Catholic in 100,000 who can't wait to get up in the morning because they've seen something or know something that, they're, that they can't, they don't want their spouse to go another day without realizing? And of course, he answered, I'm asking a rhetorical question here. There is no good news. And why is there no good news? Because we've lost the vision that, that called it good news in the first place. What was it? Listen, these people risked their lives because something had happened. Nothing has happened. That's why I say this initiative we have going on in our archdiocese and many others have gone through. We're, we're condensing the churches to get rid of the people who don't want to come for the wrong reasons. But even the people who come for the so-called right reasons, are they really? Can they tell you what the good news is? What are they coming to mass for? Fire insurance against the next world? Kind of spiritual asbestos? What's the purpose? I want to know. I genuinely want to know. I want to know what makes people get up in the morning and come to Mass. Now, I know many of the, I guess the best, the closest approximation I can imagine a devout Catholic getting to, to the answer to my question is, it makes me feel closer to God. And if that's the case, I'm all for it, okay? My anxiety and grief would be like Paul's anxiety for the churches, that there is still an infinite depth of that closeness to God that you've never even been exposed to. And it's our inheritance. It's the ancient tradition of our church that nobody knows about, including the priests who are going through the seminary this day. And it, you can tell it, <laughs> it exercises me a little bit. Okay. Uh, okay. So now, what so what do we do about it we have the wednesday gathering so one of the places i often so so i want to want to go a little bit is everybody on the get, get, uh, on the gathering now i've all muted you thank god just just kidding anyone on are you following give me a head nod if you're following. okay you're still with me i you can hear me even though i can't hear you but i can see you i can see you okay so uh Again, we have some new folks in the room and on, on the Zoom. So here, so, so, and those of you who've been here for a couple of years now have heard me say this. The single, I said earlier in today's gathering that the understanding of scripture, the understanding of the mass, the understanding of our whole Christian faith depends not on reading the literal words of the Bible or reading the catechism. It depends on the preconceived ideas of God and of God's desire for the world that we approach those texts with, okay? You, we see the world as we want to see it, not as it is. We see the scripture as we want to see it, not as it is. We see the politics as we want to see it, not as it is. 
We, every, every person comes to whatever they do or whatever they read with certain preconceived ideas, even unknown to themselves. Okay, they come to it with an interpretive framework, real sophisticated theologian, the big, big fancy word for this is hermeneutic, they come to it with a method of understanding. Okay, but the method itself is so ingrained in them that they're not able to see it. What I'm trying to lay out here for us today is the hermeneutic or the interpretive framework of the early church, which derives from St. Paul primarily and prior to him, St. John. So you've heard me say this before on The Gathering too. There's an unfolding of understanding of who Christ is. It starts with the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and John. They are recording. You heard, we heard last week when, when the gospel of Luke was introduced to us. Luke, who did not, was not an eyewitness to Jesus. He says, he speaks, he's speaking to a man named Theophilus, but Theophilus is maybe a man, but, it, but Theophilus is also a symbolic term, which means lover of God. Oh, lover of God. Other accounts have been made of the life and times of Jesus, and I have studiously examined all of them, and I've told you on the gatherings, there were over hundreds of gospels or accounts of Jesus in the early church. Luke was familiar with many of these, the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel to the, of the Hebrews, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the Gospel of Pilate, the Confession of Nicodemus. There are these documents in the early church that were all over the place, people trying to say this is what the meaning of the Christ was. Well, the church eventually boiled that down to the gospels we have today. And Mark, Mark and Matthew were two of those versions. And Luke says, I've investigated all of these. And so I am now going to try to lay down in a very orderly way what I understand to be the truth about the man Jesus. And, and, and Luke did it. You, you, I could even say, so the, the progression of the gospels from examination seems to be this order. Mark first. Matthew second, Luke third, John fourth, and then Paul, even though the letters of Paul were written prior to the gospel of Mark. <laughs> okay, all that's interesting stuff. I'm not going to go into the details of that. Okay, the letters of Paul started in about 50. They think the gospel of Mark was written in 61. Matthew was a little later. Luke, I'm, I can't remember exactly how that's dated. But what my point here is you can see a development of the understanding of who Jesus was. The councils of the church were trying to amplify that understanding even better, given the Holy Spirit fulfilling Jesus' promise in the Gospel of John. I, will, I have many more things to say to you. In other words, there are many more things for you to understand about who I am and what my meaning is for you but you are not able to absorb them right now. So I will send the Holy Spirit and he will lead you into all truth. That's why we talk about tradition in the church. It means the ongoing understanding, the ongoing unfolding of, of, of apprehension, of mystical grasp of who the person of Jesus is and therefore who the whole Trinity is and therefore what the world is in the Trinity. This understanding, this appreciation, this 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 taking in this of it all is going to expand as time moves forward. So there's a certain sense in which we know more, we, we have a, we have a, a more comprehensive, not, I, I'm, that's the wrong language to use. We have, we, have, we, we have the possibility of having a more profound understanding of Jesus than even the first apostles had. Okay, and I believe, so, and the development you see primarily is this, I'll say this, Matthew understood Jesus better than Mark. Luke understood Matthew, and, and this is not, this is a very rough and ready, and I'm not trying to make an argument in here, I'm just saying to give you the sense of how the widening understanding of Jesus, and one does not contradict the other, one builds upon the other. It's like those nesting dolls, you know, those Russian nesting dolls, there's one, in, it's the same doll, but it gets bigger. The doll we have today extends to the whole world, the cosmic Christ, okay? But inside that is the historical Jesus way down there when. And so um, so you have Matthew, let's, let's just say for sake of argument, Matthew grasped Jesus in a little fuller sense, even though it was really from a different perspective. But Matthew grasped Jesus in a large, little larger sense than Mark, Luke a little larger than Matthew, 
John larger than all three of them. Now, John was exiled on the island of Patmos, okay? So, and he died in the year about 100, they think. And he was about 16 when he knew Jesus. So he had 84 years to reflect on the one that he knew. That's why his gospel is so different from the other gospels. The other three are, gospels are called the synoptic gospels, which in Greek means similar. They're all similar, but John's stands apart because he doesn't have all the episodes that the other ones have. He has a much different account of the Eucharist. And, um, and it's different in every way, even though there's some similarity, but very little. The other three have a lot in common. And there's a very detailed study of where the three synoptic or similar gospels, where they overlap and where there's gaps between them. That's all very fast. That's called Bible study. <laughs> We're not doing that here, okay? But it's interesting. It doesn't really bring us closer to God, though, so I don't do much of it anymore, though I used to do it a lot. So John was the most mystical or most comprehensive, deepest gr person. He grasped Jesus at the deepest, most intimate level. Remember, he was the one who laid his head on the breast of Jesus. He was the one, that, the disciple that Jesus loved. But Paul understood Jesus even better than John. And the early church fathers understood Jesus even better than Paul. And throughout history, there have been mystics to whom they have grasped the full. But remember, St. Paul said, talked about the full breadth and depth of the mystery of Christ Jesus, how infinite it is. So it's always open to deeper understanding, deeper appreciation, deeper apprehension, deeper of. Deeper appreciation is really the best word I could use, okay? So that so I, I'm trying to bring to us this patristic or early church narrative about why Jesus came, who Jesus is, what he was doing when he came, and where we stand in that whole mission of Christ from the Father. And, it, and, and, and so there are two alternative narratives about the mission and meaning of Jesus. One is the Eastern one that I'm that I that I relate in this in this um, Wednesday gathering, and then there's the other one that all of us have been brought up on. Everyone in the West, whether you're Protestant or Catholic, has been brought up on the same narrative. It's it's called the doctrine of atonement. Jesus died for our sins and opened the gates of paradise, and now by His grace. Through either through faith in the Protestant denomination or through faith and good works in the Catholic tradition, you go, you're go. you able to enter through those gates. And if you don't do so well in those two areas, you stand the risk of being barred out forever and sent to a place of eternal torment. That's been the narrative in the West from at least 1100, the year 1100. I would say it's in the liturgy of our mass. It's, it's the language, of, the language is in it, but if you have a different narrative, which is what the one I'm trying to give you here in the Wednesday gathering, even the sacrificial language of the Latin narrative can be seen in a new light once the new narrative has replaced the old narrative, but that, that conversion of perspectives takes many years to really integrate. You're being exposed to it in what we're doing here on the Wednesday gatherings. Um, uh, but it takes many years to become an Eastern Catholic, okay? It, it, uh, you know, the, and there are Eastern Catholics today. They don't understand the Western Catholics any more than women understand men. I guess women understand men, but men don't understand women. And, and the, the East understands the West and they want nothing to do with it. <laughs> And the West does not understand the East and doesn't have an interest in understanding the East, but that's the death of the West. And we're seeing it happen in all our churches, okay? So, um, so I want to read to you now from this book that I've recommended before. This is an Eastern Catholic author named David Bentley Hart. And the title of the book is That All Shall Be Saved. And the main topic of the book is a, is a proposal for what is known as Christian universalism, a theory that was the dominant theory in the early church, the dominant narrative in the early church was that Christ came to earth to restore to perfect communion with God 
everything that had been become disjointed and disoriented and broken and lost. He came to save what was lost and restore what was broken and wounded and, 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 and damaged and restore it to perfect reconciliation with God, including the rebellious spirits known as the evil angels who were out of sorts with God because of their own pride and disobedience. Now, that was the primary dominant theme, at least for the first four centuries in the church, and he walks you through the arguments for that and the objections to that that have been marshaled over the years. And I'm not going to rehearse those here on this gathering. I will state now more and more confidently and boldly, because I find the logic and the theology irrefutable, that I am a devout, unrepentant uh, uh, Catholic universalist. Okay, I believe that to be true with my whole, all, every fiber of my being. But I'm not gonna. I'm not going to scandalize anybody on the gathering with that. I'm not going to argue with anybody about it. If you're interested in, and ha have some genuine openness to looking at all the objections to that theory from Protestant and Catholic sources alike, if you want to look at every scriptural objection to that to that argument and look at the counter arguments in favor of it. You can access a book by Thomas Talbot, T-A-L-B-O-T-T, -T, Thomas Talbot, or you can watch him on YouTube. Thomas Talbot, his book is called The Inescapable Love of God. The Inescapable Love of God. More so even than David Bentley Hart, Thomas Talbot, uh, respectfully and thoroughly, very much like Thomas Aquinas in a way, Thomas Aquinas, when he was trying to trying to propose something or refute something, he would always take the counter arguments to what he was trying to argue for, and he would make them stronger than his own opponents. So he would always, um, he would always, um, he would always validate the adversaries of his position, and then he would show why they were wrong. <laughs> and so Thomas Talbot and, and David Bentley Hart do the same thing. For our purposes this morning or in this gathering, I want to read you just a brief excerpt, not so brief actually, but an excerpt from David Bentley Hart's book, That All Shall Be Saved, where he addresses the Paul, the theological and spiritual Paul that has fallen over the vision of Western Christians, Catholic and Protestant alike because of their atonement narrative that has rendered them relatively incapable of seeing the redeeming love of God. Okay, so I'm going to read that to you, um, which I don't generally like to do, but I, Bill, I'll get it for you after the gathering. William, William, I'll get you each a book of that after the okay. gathering. Okay, so let's pay attention here, or just not be distracting. Okay, so this is David Bentley Hart, um, recounting what has happened in the West and what the antidote to it is in the East. Okay, and I, I hope you can, his, his rhetoric is quite, um, quite dense and rich, but I find it extremely inspiring and, and, and very funny at, at points too. So I'll, I'll, I'll do my best in rendering this to you. Okay. Um, in my early years, Eastern Christian tradition offered me some relief from my fear that the Christian story, and he's referring to the atonement model here, it offered me some relief from my early fear that the Christian story as a whole might turn out to be a grim absurdity. I learned fairly on from my exposure to Eastern Christian sources, from an attention to the original Greek of the New Testament, thank God for a classical education, and from a few especially civilized Western Christian thinkers, such as the magnificent George MacDonald. And if you've never met or heard about George MacDonald or read any of his books, you must do so. I learned from those sources that many, many of what had become the standard salvation models of the Christian tradition in later centuries especially in the West, and again, he's talking about the atonement theory, were products of a profound misreading 
of the language of Christian scripture, abetted by an absolutely abysmal historical forgetfulness. In other words, severed from the early church tradition. It is hard to know how often, and here he gets into the atonement theory. This is his description of the atonement theory. It's hard to know how often one hears it said, for example, that the Gospels or Paul's epistle teach that on the cross of Christ, God poured out his wrath on sin, or that the Son was discharging a debt humanity owed to the Father, or that Christ's blood was shed as a price paid by the Son to the Father in order to release, from the, to release us from the burden of our debt to God. And supposedly, this was all inevitable, not simply on account of sins we have individually committed, but because we had inherited a guilt contracted by our first parents, which of course must be a purely imputed guilt, guilt since no personal guilt is logically heritable. All of us, we are told, have been born damnable in the eyes of God, already condemned to hell, and justly so. And yet God, out of God's love, races to the rescue, at least of some of us, from God's wrath, because God would otherwise be technically obliged to visit his wrath upon us, if, loving, if lovingly, on account of that ancient trespass that bound us helplessly and damnably to sin before we ever existed. At the same time, however, God also lovingly fails or declines to rescue many of us because he lovingly grants us the capacity freely to love, even if he lovingly withholds the conditions that would allow us to recognize him as the object of our love, and so on. In the end, somehow, justice is supposed to have been served, love is supposed to have been vindicated, God is supposed to be good, and of all of these things, we can be sure. Happily, he says, all of this is degrading nonsense. <laughs> An absolute, me, absolute menagerie of misconceptions, fragments of scriptural language wrenched out of context, errors of translation, logical contradictions, and I suspect one or two emotional pathologies. <laughs> It came as a great consolation to me while I was still very young to discover that for the first three or four centuries of the Christian era, none of these crazy notions had taken root in either the East or the West. And that for the most part, Eastern, the Eastern Christian world has remained innocent of the worst of them up to the present day. And furthermore, that the New Testament read in the light of the proper tradition turned out to contain nothing even remotely like them. It is true, of course, that for Paul, the cross of Christ revealed the law's wrath upon sin in that it was an eminently legal murder, but it certainly revealed nothing about the will of God towards his creatures enslaved to death and was in no sense a ransom paid to the Father to avert his wrath against humanity. For the earliest Christians, and this is the real vision here, for the earliest Christians, the story of salvation was entirely one of rescue all the way through. It was the epic of God descending into the depths of human estrangement to release his creatures from the bondage to death penetrating even into the heart of Hades itself to set the captives free and to recall his prodigal children from their suffering and to restore a broken creation. The sacrifice of Christ was not a ransom paid to the Father. Rather, it was a remuneration fee given for the pur purpose or releases of slaves held in bondage to death's own household. It was a delight for me to discover various reflections on the part of the theologians of the early centuries regarding whether it was proper to say that this fee had been paid to the devil 
or only to death, or to no one at all, in such as when someone who lays down their life for another has paid the price, even if there is no particular recipient for the fee thus rendered. And so it was even a greater delight for me to discover that none of these same theologians had even momentarily considered the bizarre idea that there was a price paid to the Father, the coin of some sublimely circular transaction in which God buys off God in order to spare us God's displeasure, <laughs> rather like a bank issuing itself credit to pay off a debt that it owes to itself using a currency it has minted for the occasion and certified its value wholly on the idea of the very credit it is issuing to itself. <laughs> okay, so I can stop there. Let's see. So let me see if there's another. Yeah, okay. For the earliest and greatest of the church fathers, the story of salvation was really quite uncomplicated. We were born in bondage, in the house of a cruel master, the devil, in the heart of a cruel master to whom we had been sold as slaves before we could choose for ourselves. We were born, moreover, not guilty or damnable in God's eyes, but nevertheless corrupted and enchained by mortality and so destined to sin through a congenital disability of will. We were ill, impaired, lost, and dying. We were in hell already. But then Christ came to set us free, to buy us out of slavery, to heal us, to restore us to our true estate. In pursuit of those he loved, he invaded even the very depths of that hell we have made for ourselves and for one another in the cosmos, in the history, and in our own hearts, so as to drag us to himself, to use the actual language of John 12, 32, when I am lifted up, I will drag all things to myself. Whatever variations were worked upon, this grand guiding theme in the early centuries of the faith, none of them ever incorporated the discordant claim that innocent blood had to be spilled to assuage God's indignation. And so, considered in these heartening terms, the language of hell seemed much less inexplicable to me, much less atrocious. If hell is simply God's enemy, which he has set out to conquer, and the spoil of its captives, and if we then refuse to him, refuse to be joined to him in love and faith, and if we thereby condemn ourselves to a suffering that he does not desire for us, who can reproach God for our perversity? And he actually doesn't believe that anybody can even do that for good reasons as well. So I'll leave that as that. Could you follow that okay? Yeah, okay. So so the point is that this notion of a vindictive God who demands the sacrifice of his son to appease an anger against people who are not, uh, not responsible for what they did in the first place is so utterly illogical, incoherent, and insane. And yet it be, continues to be the dominant, unquestioned, unthought about, and unmeditated upon metaphor for most people's celebration and most priests celebration of the sacramental mystery. So until that understanding changes and until we have a whole different vision of the person, mission, and uh, message of Christ, uh, there'll be no good news, there'll be good, no good news to tell the world as well. It, the, the better news would be our God is a monster, stay as far away as you possibly can. That would be the thing to do. Um, but we don't do that. So we have to we have to then uh, go back to the sources and uh, ask ourselves, um, what is it? What, what is it that we need to know about God that would help us to do this? Let me read you this quote that I received from my good friend, Stephen Roberts. He's often on the Wednesday gatherings. He sends me a quote of the day from the early church fathers every day. And here's the one I got yesterday. This is St. Simeon, the new theologian. 
he actually wasn't quite, didn't quite qualify as an early church father, but his spirituality is Eastern Catholic. What is the aim of the incarnate word of God preached in the Holy Scriptures, but we who read them never even comprehend? The aim of the eternal word is that having entered into what is our own, we should participate in what is his own. <laughs> having entered into what is our own human nature, we should participate in what is his own, the divine nature. The Son of God has become the Son of Man in order to make us men sons of God. Raising our race to what he is by himself in nature. Granting us birth from above through the grace of his spirit and leading us straight away into the kingdom of heaven, which is life in the Trinity. In order that we, not, that we should be not merely fed by the hope of entering the life of God, but entering into full possession of it, and should be able to cry with the apostle, my life is hid with Christ in God. Now, if that kind of theology were being taught in our seminaries and in our churches, that you are one with God by birth, and the only thing that it keeps you from appropriating your birthright are the theories about God that you put in your head that blind your thoughts to your heart. I mean, all you have to do is look at the beauty of creation and you can feel your oneness with God. But we can't do that. Why? Because our thinking interferes. That's why orthodoxy means right thinking. Thinking, having the proper narrative about, about, it's really this simple. We come from God and we return to God. And in between time, we are meant to mirror that destiny of glory, which is our inheritance by virtue of our creation. Okay. I was corrupted at birth. I thought I read that at one of the readings there, that we were born corrupted. We are born into a world that is estranged from God because number what we're estranged from God in a number in a number of ways. Uh, number one, because we are not God. So we do not because we are finite, just because we are limited. Our apprehension of God, our knowledge of God is real but it's limited. In other words, we can know God as God truly is, but we cannot know God as God himself knows himself. Even when our souls separate from our body and we have a near death or a continuing death experience. Death, George, I was reading something from George MacDonald. You heard me mention that name in what I read here. He was a great novelist of the 19th century. He was a, a Calvinist who had the worst he was raised in a religion, which still exists today, that is the most severe version of that atonement model. I mean, the Catholic model, by contrast, is tame yeah. compar compared to the, yeah. to the, and it all comes from St. Augustine, that, that not, not only will not all people be saved, very few will be saved. Those in heaven will take delight in the sufferings of those in pain, okay. and it will add to God's glory. Now, if you can get more insane than that, I'd like to know how it is, but it's, it is the case, and it still happens, and there are people out there, and Thomas Talbot addresses those people, and they argue from Scripture, naturally. I mean, hell, the devil argued from Scripture, so anybody can argue from Scripture. Uh, the first words to the devil from Jesus were quotes from scripture. So mm -hmm. don't go to scripture to, to, to support your arguments. You're, you might be well, it might well be in the league of the devil. You can use scripture to illustrate what you're saying, but not to make an argument. Okay. What, what was I talking about? George McDonald. So he can, but he had a complete change of, of course. And I've handed you on uh, people who've been here in person on the Wednesday gathering, I've given them a copy of George MacDonald's sermon called um, um, uh, The Consuming Fire. 
in Hebrews, we hear God is a consuming fire. He's a fire of mercy, fire of love. When, when our hearts are on fire, the sacred heart of Jesus is a fire of love. And if I have not loved and I enter the fire of Jesus, I go through hell, literally. But, but, but the, hell, the hell of the fire of love is always remedial. It's to burn away the dross. It's to purify the gold. It's it, the, the God's, God's, God's love is punishing to those who have not learned to love. Those who have learned to love meld with God like two flames to each other. But if my heart is cold and I encounter the loving flaming heart of the sacred heart, ah! feels like hell. Well, that's, that's what the early church fathers meant by hell. It's the entrance of a human being who in their ignorance and darkness, you see, one of the reasons, one of the arguments for, for why, we're, why we're not culpable totally is we are deceived. Our knowledge of God is limited, therefore, because we're finite, therefore, our ideas of any other person are by definition wrong. That is to say, they are incomplete. I do not know the whole truth about any other person. That's why Jesus says, judge not lest you be judged. I have no knowledge. I cannot judge without perfect knowledge. And no one but God has perfect knowledge. Therefore, all judgment belongs to God. But as I said earlier, to understand completely is to forgive completely. So in God's mind, he knows what we do to each other. St. Irenaeus even said he hardwires us to do things harmful to each other. As strange as that sounds, Irenaeus says, and I'm going to paraphrase slightly because to make sense out of it for you who are hearing this maybe for the first time, Irenaeus says, since he who relieves hurts, what Irenaeus really says is, since he who saves, okay, but the word save in Greek means salve, which means healing. So he who heals, he who, he who, he who heals wounds existed always existed from all eternity. Jesus, the healer, the wound, the, the, the one who heals, all because he who heals, because he who saves, always existed, Irenaeus says, it was necessary that those who would need to be healed, that is to say those who cause each other hurt, it was necessary that those, I'm going to paraphrase now, it was necessary that those who should, who cause each other hurt, should be created so that he who heals would not exist in vain. <laughs> mm. See, in God's mind, evil is permitted for a greater good, and evil is permitted to do its thing for a period and a day. We know the devil's time is limited. Mm -hmm. It is permitted by God so that God's glory in, heal, in allowing his son to be our restorer it's as if God allows us to become damaged, like damaged pieces of art, so that his son, who is a master restorer, can work on us a little bit and put us back into a place and give us a greater glory and a greater stature and a greater beauty and a greater glory, <laughs> value. The value than we had when we were originally created. It's as if the Father creates us for the Son. He sends us down here into the valley of damage. We get damaged. Then his Son picks us up, either in this life or the next life, and he restores us. And then he returns us to his Father, and he says, look at this. I made him better than you did. <laughs> and what does the father say? The father says, that's my son. <laughs> I would lose nothing if I didn't forget it. And, I, and I, it, it is the will of my father that I lose nothing of what he has given. What has he given? Everything. Mm -hmm. So how could I lose anything? So all these are the arguments for and against universalism. But I want you to see the all-encompassing vision here. I, I, to me, the reason I become such a convinced universalist is I can't, there is, I can't imagine anything not being restored by God to God. I just can't imagine it. The, the, the primary argument against it, of course, is human freedom. And I really encourage you to read Thomas Talbot or David Bentley Hart, because it's a total misunderstanding of freedom that believes 
that a person in their right mind could freely reject something that every form of their rational reason told them is good for them. If I, if, you know, and, I, and, I, and of course, what we account as good is different for every person. But take the thing that you consider to be the best thing possible, okay? So if you, if you said to Donald Trump or to Joe Biden or to Hillary Clinton, I'm offering you the presidency and they're in their right mind, which we know that none of them is, okay? We know that. But in their mind, they're in their right mind. See, whatever a person cherishes as their higher good, lines up perfectly with what their mind tells them is the higher good. So nobody in their, but, but and what I'm distinguishing here in a way is to be in my right mind is not necessarily to be in my current mind, okay? And to pr put, the, put the revelation back even a, a step further, in this life, no matter how holy we are, None of us is ever in our perfectly right mind. We are always, to a certain degree, crazy. That, by that I mean, because we are finite and limited in our knowledge and in our wisdom, none of us sees clearly about anything or anyone. St. Paul says, I see through a dark dimly, a glass darkly. He means that vis-a-vis -vis God and vis-a-vis -vis the world. Nobody sees things as God sees them. Therefore, all judgments are absolutely by definition forbidden, or any, to put it conversely, any judgment that is made is by definition wrong. Now, once you awaken to that fact, you'll realize that people pick people so i want to make two points here i'm confusing them i'm i'm conflating them and i'm confusing you to a certain extent so point number 1 none of us is in our right mind perfectly we will not be in our right mind till we are freed from our bodies and our finite we'll always be finite but we will not always be limited by our bodies okay and our brains and the biochemical processes that shroud to a certain extent our pure apprehension of the world of spirit that happens when we die and our soul separates from our body. Watch some of those near-death experiences. Some are kooky, but many are resonate very clearly with Christian, the deepest strains of Christian mystical tradition. And they validate it from a certain point because they're unprejudiced coming in. They have no, most of these people who have them have no religion at all. So they have no dog in the in the hunt. Okay, but that being said, so our right mind is not really given to us until we are in Christ completely. I believe you can be like St. Paul or others of the saints, and of course it goes without saying everybody on this Wednesday gathering, uh, who do, do, do have a kind of clarity of vision, but, but you, you almost might call a person who has clarity of vision, well, they do call them that, clairvoyant. They, they see clearly, which means they see in greater depth. All that being said, but in this world, we we uh, we apprise so so we apprise things as good, depending on how reasonable, how how ra rationally satisfying they are for us. We are rational creatures. I cannot have freedom that is not rational freedom, but because there's a there's a kind of irrational freedom. Okay. If, if a person puts their hand in the fire and they get burned and they pull it out, they rationally realize this is not good for me. If a person puts their, plunges their fire hand, they're rational, but they plunge, or they, they plunge their hand back into the fire just to show that they're free to do it. You would not call that an exercise of freedom. You would not even call that that's certain. So, so that you would call that an act of insanity, and it's not freedom. It's 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 an impulse. It's no more than a it's no more than a than a than a than a than a impulse. That's what it is. So it's a random, arbitrary, irrational impulse, and people do do that, and we call them insane. Okay. So so people people who are rational choose goods that are in 
alignment with their rationality. Now, everybody's rationality can be deceived and everybody's rationality is to a certain extent deceived. But I never choose something, depending on my level of rationality, everybody, everybody has some sense of rationality, even I suppose even the insane, there's a kind of rationality that makes them want to do it. It's not what we would call God-given, well, I'm not going to, anyway, there's, there's rational and there's irrational, and we know the difference when we see them, even if I can't define it very clearly right now. When I choose something, I always choose it because it appears to be good to me, okay? And the point I was trying to make earlier, that it's inconceivable that someone could be presented with something that they apprise as ultimately good and reject it freely. In fact, I think as you investigate the matter, and Talbot and David Hart go into this at much greater detail than I'm going to do this morning, because we're almost close to the end here, but freedom becomes, I become, I become, the, the more, the more understanding I have, the freer I become, and paradoxically, the less choices I have. We tend to think of freedom as having the ability of infinite choices. It's just the opposite. Infinite freedom means I have no need to choose anymore because I know, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is good for me. I don't want any other, whether it's choosing a spouse, you and no other. You see, in this life, we always sometimes think we have another option. The grass always seems greener. And that's what causes so much pain. That's the hurt. But in God's world, we are freed from that hurt. Freedom is being beyond the need to have deliberative choice. Why? Because I know what I need to know in order to choose what I know to be good for me. If I, but everybody chooses what they believe to be good for them. So if I choose to eat that big pizza because it really looks good to me today, and I wake up in the toilet in the middle of the night, I will realize I've chosen something that appeared to be good. It even appeared to be rationally good. But now I realize I was acting crazy and I'm sick. And even in that realization, you can see how God has used my sickness the consequence of my evil choice, which wasn't really evil choice because at the moment I thought I was doing the right thing. I thought I was doing the good thing. I was blinded. I did do something wrong. It did turn out to be evil, but you wouldn't say this person deserves eternal hell for that because I wasn't really culpable. I wasn't in my right mind, even though I thought I was. All of these arguments go into the fact that we are held in bondage by the deceiver, and when we know the good, we want nothing other than the good, but the goods that we choose are not the good that we really need and want. But if we knew that, we would not reject it any more than I was not able not to eat that pizza that night. I didn't want the broccoli when I saw the pizza. I didn't even want the broccoli on the table when I saw the pizza. Okay, when we see, when we're presented with God that way, all of the lesser goods seem, I don't even want to consider them as options. I don't need the options. The example that David Bentley Hart uses, and I'll finish with this, to show how the human person, the totally rational human person who has been set free, you will know the truth. See there, you see it again. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. I'm not free when I don't know the truth. Everyone who sins is deceived about the good. Everyone who sins is a slave, or slave to sin, John 8, 24. Those who sin are slaves to sin. Everyone who sins is deceived. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Deception results in sin, Sin results in slavery. Both deception and slavery are not things that human beings are held culpable for, even in this world, how much more so in the next world, okay? All that being said, David Bentley Hart talks about the truly, who is the truly free person? The truly free person who is the one who knows what is truly good. 
So the example he uses is of a little story called The Lady and the Tiger. It's written by a guy named Frank Stockton. You can read it. It's a very short story, but the story is this. The king, this guy's, this, this young prince is in love with a princess. And so he goes to the king and says, I would, I want to marry your daughter. And he says, I'm not sure my daughter wants to marry you. And he says, well, she's flirting with me from the tower. And I think she's in love with me. And he said, well, are you really sure? And he said, I'm not sure, but I would like permission to court her. And the king says, well, I'll do you one better than that. He says, I'll let you marry her. He says, so, but you have to make a choice. Okay. Prince says, great. What, what, what is it? So he brings his daughter down. He puts her behind one door and he, well, there's two doors. He says, come back tomorrow. So he, Prince comes back tomorrow. There's two doors. And he says, behind one door is that beautiful princess whom you think loves you. And the princess is making all, the princess and he have never talked, but she's making, you know, they're communicating from the tower and he's been visiting her now for a long time. And um, she wants to get out of the tower. And he wants to marry her. Behind the other door is a tiger, man-eating tiger, who's been starved for a month. And the king says, you have to choose one door or the other. You get, you get whatever door opens, you get. Do you either get to marry my daughter or you get to be eaten by the tiger? Now, David Bent, and so, and, and so in the story, the actual story by Frank Stockton, the, the, there's been a little seed of doubt planted in the prince's mind. So he doesn't know if the, if, if the girl is really playing with him or not and whether she's just leading him on and really doesn't love him. And so he, so I, I can't remember how that story ends, but David Hart twists it slightly. And he says, now ask yourself this question. If the princess had a secret code with the guy from the tower, and the code was, if I blink once, the tiger's behind the first door. If I blink twice, the tiger's Suppose she was able to communicate that to the, to the prince. When the prince faces the two doors, when would he be freer? Knowing what was behind the doors or not knowing? And of course, the answer is knowing. More knowledge, more freedom. Less knowledge, more choices, less freedom. More arbitrary the choice, the more insanity. And most people's lives, of course, are like wind chimes, moving from one to the other with no knowledge of the truth. But on the Wednesday gathering, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Okay, let's finish with the glory be, and then we'll, um, I'll stay on for a little while. We'll have any other questions. Name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, and now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Thank you all.